Okay. Uh, yeah. Welcome to my lightning talk about uh, reporting and transparent research practices in orthopedics and sports medicine clinical trials. Um, just to let you know, it's 2.30 a.m. in the morning, so everything which is less than perfect, this is my excuse. But um, yeah, let's start with the role of um, reporting quality in medical research. In general, medical research um, is done to improve healthcare for patients, and um, yeah, clinical uh, trials um, shall provide um, information for healthcare. So, um, cl clinical trials are used to um, provide trustworthy, reproducible, and generalizable information on clinical decisions like treatments and diagnosis. And uh, we need comprehensive reporting as this is necessary to distinguish between trials uh, with low and with high risk of bias, and therefore to estimate how likely study outcomes um, translate into clinical practice. And this whole topic of comprehensive reporting or reporting of clinical trials is covered by the consort guidelines, which are very um, widely used in the field and endorsed by over 580 journals. So, um, yeah, this should be a really straightforward process, but still we regularly encounter things like this. This is a risk of bias assessment from a recent meta-analysis, and um, we can see that for the most criteria, um, there are some studies with low risk of bias, some studies with high risk of bias, but the very majority of studies has an unclear risk of bias. And this is problematic as um, yeah, there's just not enough information presented in the um, paper to make a risk of bias assessment. And for the clinician who reads a paper to inform his own clinical practice in the end, and um, he just cannot make the decision if the uh, research presented is robust enough to guide his own clinical practice. And this is a problem. And we wanted to see how researchers in orthopedics and sports medicine deal with uh, those topics. And luckily we found out that there are many reviews and commentaries um, around that are calling for more transparent research practices in the field. And um, this is good news. However, um, most empirical references come from other disciplines like in this example, or if there's a field specific, they're really narrow scope. So we decided to run an old study um, to provide a more comprehensive overview. And um, it was a cross-sectional meta-research study on reporting prevalence and transparent research practices in orthopedics and sports medicine. We used um, the top 25% of journals in orthopedics and sports medicine as a sample and ended up with 163 clinical trials from 27 different journals. And we looked at different criteria of pre-registration, open data, scientific rigor, and so on. And um, all screening and assessment steps were done by two independent reviewers. And um, yeah, let's come into the results. Uh, we found out that authors usually report general information about methodology and rigor criteria, which is really good. But we also saw that only few provide the essential details that are really necessary to do the risk of bias assessment in the end. And we can see this. Um, in those examples, we see almost all trials had a randomization statement somewhere in the paper, but only about half of them had a um, proper randomization method described. And we see similar trends um, and tendencies for blinding, for sample size calculations, and for other rigor criteria. We also found out that um, data availability statements were only included in 12% of trials, and that no trials shared data in open repositories. And um, similar things, um, uh, trial registration was only reported in about half of the trials, even though this is mandatory for clinical trials, and only 20% of trials were pre-registered. This is especially unfortunate as uh, pre-registered studies were shown in our um, exploratory analysis as uh, they are more likely to report information on randomization, blinding, sample size calculation, and so on. So what shall we do with those findings now? Uh, we have three different main directions on our paper and our preprint. One is education, but done differently. I think there's a place for more concise, practice-oriented uh, educational materials, like this one from our preprint. 
and um, yeah, the next possible direction, which is described a bit more in detail in the paper, is to create awareness, probably with dashboards, um, to monitor reporting and transparent research practices, and also yeah, assistance in the publication process for the authors themselves. Um, we have great automated screening tools around, um, and they can be used on preprints or can also be implemented into the peer review process. Um, the screen key group is uh, a good example that's already done on preprints. And another um, option would be interactive writing templates. I know um, there's a trial going on by the Equator Network, which is looking into this topic. So we have high hopes that um, we can introduce some change in the future. And yeah, this was my short lightning talk. You can see here uh, the QR code of our preprint. So when you, uh, if you want to have a closer look, um, you're warmly invited. And otherwise, you can also reach out uh, via Twitter. And other than that, I'm looking forward to the upcoming discussions. And yeah, thanks. Great, thank you so much. And we do have a few minutes if anyone has a question they want to pop into the Q&A. Um, we can do that. Otherwise, we will move on to the next talk in just a minute. Let's see if there's any questions. All right, if not, then we'll move on to our next speaker, Sidin Heinel. Um, so Robert, if you don't mind stopping your screen share and then Sidin, go ahead. And thank you, Robert, for joining us at such a late time. We really appreciate yeah. it. Hello, can you hear me now? Yep, we can hear Hello. you. Okay, perfect, sorry for the delay. Okay, thank you um, for giving me the possibility to present um, our online platform, animalstudyregistry.org here today. It's a pre-registration platform specifically conceived for animal research and um, it aims to improve animal welfare and translation at the same time. And since I saw that at this conference, most of you are probably familiar with the concept of pre-registration, I thought I will start with the animal part um, of the platform and talk a little bit about our motivation. So as you know, um, um, animal experimentation is still uh, largely debated in our society and our society accepts um, the conduction of animal experiments only under the basic assumption that this will contribute to medical progress or scientific progress uh, via any gain of knowledge. However, in the last years, it became more and more clear that um, an important part of animal experiments is actually never published, which represents, of course, a huge ethical uh, issue. And to just quickly put a number on it, I would like to present two studies which uh, recent studies which uh, try to uh, define a publication rate of um, data coming from animal experiments. So they both used a similar approach. They looked at animal study protocols, which have to be written by each scientist within the European Union, Union which want to conduct animal experiments. And they followed up these protocols and looked um, how many of these protocols led to at least one publication after six or seven years. And here in two German university medical centers, they found a publication rate of 67%. And in another study from the Netherlands, they found a publication rate of 60%. And um, here they also looked not only at the whole protocol, whether this protocol led to a publication, but they also looked at individual animals. So all the animals which were uh, uh, written in the animal protocol, which were planned for the study, um, how many of these were reported in final publication. 
And here the number dropped to 26%, so very low. And so um, this is of course a huge ethical problem, but uh, in addition, the, the scientists were asked, or were asked also about uh, the reasons why um, they did not publish uh, results. And the main reason um, was negative, so-called negative results. And on the second, um, the second reason mentioned uh, were problems related to the methods. But so these animals are not only not contributing to, to uh, a knowledge gain, they also then later contribute to the publication bias by, um, because only the positive results are mentioned. And this of course also contributes to an insufficient translation from experimental studies into clinics. Uh, here I just show the example of a meta-analysis meta from uh, stroke research where they looked at positive results in experimental studies up to clinical studies and you can see a huge drop. Of course, this is not only due to uh, publication bias, there are further reasons, including um, questionable research practices or problems with the study design or the reporting. But um, uh, all these points then brought us um, to developing uh, this pre-registration platform as pre-registration can address a lot of these problems. So it can encourage the publication of all gained results and it can also prevent um, questionable research practices like p-hacking or hacking. So in 2019, we launched the Animal Study Registry.org uh, website, which I would just invite you to have a look at it. So you can screen also to already pre-registered study here and studies here in the search without um, the need to create an account. And it's an online platform which is operated by the German Center for the Protection of Laboratory Animals, which is part of the Federal Institute for Risk Assessment. So it's a governmental initiative and it's free of charge and it's open to all scientists around the world um, conducting animal research. And I would just like to quickly guide you through the registration process. So after developing an idea, scientists can enter their study in our template. Uh, this also supports in designing a study and it's mainly based on the ARRIVE guidelines, which are the uh, main reporting guidelines for in vivo animal research, which are also endorsed already by uh, most journals. And after filling up uh, the form, this can be submitted. And after submission, there are still two weeks where scientists can um, retract or edit um, their, re uh, their study. Otherwise, it will automatically be registered and receive a DOI, a digital object identifier. It cannot be changed anymore. However, it doesn't mean it's immediately public because authors can opt for an embargo period uh, for up to five years where the study is only visible with its title, the institution where it's conducted, a short summary, and optionally the name of the author. And if during this uh, process there are any changes to the protocol, this can be updated anytime, there can be comments added anytime, and also um, links can be inserted to data repositories or publications and uh, thus link the outcome with the pre-registration. And um, we see already this uh, 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 um, faster uptake within the last month. However, um, the uptake uh, still needs to be accelerated. And we're talking to stakeholders, to research institutes, funders and publishers to value pre-registration. And of course, also to scientists, because one major problem in biomedical research is that uh, many scientists are still not aware of the possibility to pre-register their research at all. So um, here we try to really go to conferences and to talk to scientists. And with this, I would like to end. And um, yeah, just I mentioned also some, some um, publications if you're further interested. And otherwise, uh, we're happy, um, I'm happy if uh, you get in touch with us and um, would like to thank you and also happy to take some questions. Thank you. Great, thanks so much. We do have a minute or two for questions if there are any, but I don't see any yet.
Thank you very much for your presentation. So we'll go on to our third speaker, Alexa Tullet. So Celine, if you could stop your screen share. Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Alexa. Uh, 10 minutes is a short amount of time, so I'm going to sort of cut straight to the chase. Um, so much like uh, sports medicine and animal research, uh, psychology has its problems, one of which um, is that there's been growing concern about the rate of false positives uh, in psychology. And so um, in our study, uh, we asked psychologists about their perceptions of this problem, and we had, uh, let's see, 5% um, of our participants um, who are practicing psychologists said that the rate of false positives in the published psychology literature is acceptably low. 60% um, said the sort of medium answer. So they said that the rate of false positives is somewhat higher than it should be and we should try to lower it. Um, and then the, the true skeptics, the 35% say that the rate of false positives in the psychology literature is much higher than it should be and we should take major steps to lower it. Um, so one solution to this problem that has been proposed is the solution of replication. Um, as uh, Brian Nozick and his colleagues noted in their 2012 paper, uh, replication is a means of increasing the confidence in the truth value of a claim, right? So in this sense, replication can sort of contribute to self-correction in our field, um, or so they or so they claimed. Um, and, uh, but in order for this to be true, it has to be the case that uh, psychologists also update their beliefs in response um, to replications. Um, and not all psychologists have equally uh, positive, optimistic views about replication. For instance, one of our participants said, not all researchers are equally competent. People who are going nuts about the so-called replication crisis are entirely ignorant to the fact that people who come up with original research are much more competent than people who attempt and fail to replicate. Um, that's why original researchers succeed and replicators fail. Those who can do science and those who can't fail to replicate. Um, so this is a particularly uh, curmudgeonly participant, um, but as we can see, uh, some people are skeptical about how seriously we should take the results of replications. Um, so in this project, we attempted to uh, directly test this question and look at how much psychologists update their beliefs in response to replication evidence. Um, so I'll focus on three hypotheses here. Uh, the first is that psychologists will update their beliefs um, in response to new evidence. So we suspected that um, psychologists would change their beliefs somewhat when they learned about the results of replication studies, um, but that they would not update as much as our Bayesian model would dictate. Um, so what we attempted to do was to sort of model how much uh, participants should update their beliefs given their priors um, and given the strength of the replication evidence. Um, so we, we compared this to the Bayesian model and we thought psychologists might not go as far as a Bayesian model would say they should. Um, we also hypothesized that psychologists might not update as much as they predicted they would. Um, so we had some of our participants predict how much they would update their beliefs given certain hypothetical replication outcomes. And we thought maybe people predict that they'll update a certain amount, but when actually in the situation won't update as much as they expect. So briefly, uh, the methodology that I'll focus on um, for today is we had uh, participants in the control condition. So this is 572 um, psychologists. And we had them evaluate the results of original studies, but specifically original studies that were slated to be replicated by various um, large scale replication projects. And we got these participants to tell us essentially their actual prior, okay? So this is their belief in the effect that is reported in the original study. So the extent to which they think that that effect is likely to be um, non-trivial in size or real effect. Um, so this is what they did in phase one. And then we also had participants in a prediction condition. Uh, these participants did the same thing as those in the control condition, except they also made predictions about how they would respond given different uh, replication outcomes. 
Okay, then about a year and a half later, um, once the replication results were in, we did phase two and we assessed participants actual posteriors in the control condition, as well as a prediction condition. So here participants are reading about the results of replication studies that replicated the original effects um, that they evaluated in stage one. Um, and so now they're telling us, okay, given the results of these replication studies, now what is your belief um, in the effect? Okay. Uh, so, so you have sort of a sense of what it's like to be a participant in this study. Um, I'll give you an example of uh, a study that participants were asked to evaluate. So this is what you would see in phase one. You'd see a uh, description of original study. It would include the citation and sort of a summary of uh, the goals of the research, uh, a little bit of information about the sample, and then the key finding. This is what uh, participants are providing their priors for, right? Uh, in this case, uh, the study investigated whether a deliberate analytic processing style can be activated by incidental disfluency cues that suggest task difficulty. Participants attempted to solve syllogisms presented in either easy hard, or hard to read font. The manipulation of font was an incidental introduction of disfluency. Um, and the effect that they observed in the original study was that participants in the hard to read versus easy to read condition um, answered more syllogisms correctly. The effect size was a D of 0.64 um, and the p-value is 0.051. Um, so if you're sort of like interested in testing yourself, you can, uh, you can guess what you think the effect within the population will be or what, the, or what you think the um, effect observed in the replication will be. Um, and that's what I'll show you next. So when participants come back, in phase two, after they've told us what they think the effect in the population is at this point, we show them the results of the replication evidence. In this case, the results are that participants in the hard to read versus easy to read condition uh, did not answer significantly more syllogisms correctly. Uh, in this case, the effect size estimate is a D of point, sorry, negative 0 0.03 um, with a p-value of 0.43. Um, so in this case, the results of the replication were really inconsistent with the results of the original study um, and would suggest that potentially uh, observers or uh, our participants should adjust their belief in the effect downward. Uh, just a little bit of a um, sort of like a brief primer on how we calculated their Bayesian posterior. So this is what we said they should update to. Um, given uh, various assumptions. So to give you an example, imagine that your prior, um, so your estimate of the uh, likelihood that the effect is real when reading about the first original study, imagine you estimate that the effect is a D of 0.25 and you say the probability that that effect is more than 0.1. So the probability that it's more than what we defined as a trivial effect is 85%. We basically compute a distribution based on those values, um, and that distribution is represented here in green. Uh, then we also created a distribution that reflects the um, evidence from the replication, and that's in blue here. So for example, if a replication found a D of 0.05 and a standard error of 0.05, um, you would see a distribution that looks like the blue one represented here to compute people's um, Bayesian posterior. So the, uh, the posterior that they should arrive at if they adjust according to our Bayesian model, basically we combine those two distributions. So, so we create a weighted average of the two. Um, that's represented here in purple. And in this case, it happens to have a, pr a probability of 27.2%. Um, that the effect is greater than 0.1. So the Bayesian posterior here um, would be 27.2%, a combination of the participants prior and the replication evidence. Okay, um, let me walk you through this first graph here. So this is focusing on the control condition. Um, and this is instances where participants should adjust downward. You can sort of see this as um, instances where replications failed, if you want to sort of use a heuristic, um, which is almost redundant with when participants should adjust downward, but not quite. What you can see here is the purple box is their priors. Um, and then with these failed replications, uh, for sake of brevity, um, we see that when participants read 
about the replication evidence, they adjust their belief downward. Okay, so they are reacting to the evidence provided in the replication. But what you can see here is the Bayesian posterior, right, in this third box um, is almost at zero in this case, right? So uh, participants, according to our model, should be adjusting much more um, than they do in practice. Uh, if we look at the control condition when participants should adjust upwards, so you could see this as successful replications, um, as again, heuristic. So they start with their priors, just over 70% um, likelihood that the effect is real. And then uh, they adjust upwards slightly in the blue box, uh, but they should have adjusted more according to our Bayesian model, which is um, very close to 100% for many participants. Um, then I'm going to show you the same information for the uh, prediction condition. So it's going to have one extra box. And what you can take from these next two graphs is simply that in uh, situations where participants should adjust downward, um, they do so very similarly to the way that they predict that they would, or the people in the prediction condition predict that they would. In situations where they should adjust upward, in fact, they adjust more than they predicted. Um, so it's not simply that when you ask people hypothetically what they do, they say, sure, I'll update my beliefs. Um, but then when they're asked to actually update their beliefs, they don't do it. Um, so they seem to adjust as much or more than they would predict. So to summarize, um, we found evidence that psychologists update their beliefs in response to new evidence um, and that they did not update as much as our Bayesian model would dictate um, and that they we didn't support our hypothesis that they would not update as much as they predicted. Um, to summarize even more, uh, replications can contribute to self-correction within psychology so people do adjust their beliefs um, but our results suggest that psychologists either underestimate the evidentiary value of replication studies, distrust replication um, evidence, or perhaps some combination of both. Thanks. Great, thank you so much. Um, we're out of time, unfortunately, but I'm sure if you have questions for Alexa that you can find her. Um, so we're now moving on to our next session. So we're gonna switch the panelists now and bring in the um, um, next panelists. So bear with us as we do that. All right. And the moderator for our next session is Brianne. And so I'll hand it over to you, Brianne. Thank you. I'll just share my screen. Great. So we're just waiting for one more panelist. But I did hear from Kleber that there is a rainstorm and uh, his power was going out, flickering lights. So hopefully, oh, they're there. So it looks like everybody's here. Just give another minute. Thank you to our European colleagues who are joining in the middle of the night. Great, I'll get started. So thank you for joining our session on empowering early career researchers to improve science. Our panelists today are Humberto Debat, um, who'll be talking about his role in Panlingua. We have Dr. Nafisa Jadavi, uh, who will be talking about her role in reproducibility for everyone. We have Dr. Gary McDowell, um, who's working with Light Toller as a consultant, uh, and we'll talk about his work with Future of Research. We also have Clee Bernese, who will be talking about his role with the Brazilian Reproducibility Initiative. I'm the moderator today, Brianne Kent. I was an organizer of the event that we'll be talking about today that really inspired this panel. And I'm an assistant professor in neuroscience at Simon Fraser University in Canada. I'll welcome our co-moderator, Tracy Weisgerber, who um, is a member of the eLife Early uh, Career Advisory Group and works at Quest in Berlin. 
uh, and she was the lead organizer of the event that has inspired this panel. It is uh, very late in Germany, so she's not going to have a formal presentation today, but she's, she's joining us um, just the same, which is wonderful. So this panel was inspired by ideas generated during a global virtual unconference. And an unconference is an unconventional conference which really tries to take the strengths and benefits of the coffee chats that happen at a conference and turn it into the main highlight. So we're really trying to promote discussion, debate, um, participation in an unconference instead of just having somebody give a talk and people listen um, like what's happening right now. So our unconference had brought 54 invited participants they were mostly early career researchers who had extensive experience in improving science culture and practice. And the details of the event have been published uh, in an article, I'll give you that link later, um, but the results of the discussion and the outcome of the discussion of the two days um, are all posted in a preprint on osf.io right here. And the preprint's called Empowering early career researchers to improve science. So I'll just start by saying thank you to all the participants who, who attended the event, Welcome Trust who provided some funding, and a special thanks uh, to my co-organizers of the event, Tracy Weisgeber and Constance, who hopefully is asleep in bed in Germany. So the unconference covered um, four main topics. The first was why do we need early career researchers to improve science? The second was what obstacles do early career researchers face when working to improve science? The third was how can others support early career researchers working to improve science? And we've, we let, final, or left concluded with tips and strategies for early career researchers working to, on science reform, um, drawing from the experiences of the 54 participants to say what worked, what didn't work, what do you wish you knew um, at the beginning? And so when we say trying to promote science reform or trying to improve science, we really mean, mean a broad range of different topics. So some groups are working on trying to improve and modernize publishing um, with open access journal articles. Uh, other groups are working on reproducibility of science. Uh, others are really focused on changing the rewards and the incentives. Um, other initiatives are focused on public involvement and promoting science communication. There's also those that are trying to increase diversity in science and make sure that there are more perspectives from around the globe. Uh, and as well, early career researcher training and working conditions. So there's just a wide range of topics that we're referring to when we're talking about science improvement and science reform. So why do we need early career researchers to be part of the reform efforts? Well, early career researchers are the future leaders. They're the most diverse cohort of scientists, so much more diverse than their mid-career and senior scientists co colleagues. Early career researchers, because they're early in their career, may be more open to new solutions than more senior scientists who have had their careers, built their careers in the system that, that is now. Early career researchers are also more often on the forefront of technical innovations because they're actively doing the science. They're still at the bench. They're still seeing the innovation that's happening and being a part of it at the bench, in the lab, in the field. Um, and so they're really aware of where changes can be made and, um, and how improvements could actually benefit the science and how it's done. Some early career researchers may also have the time and energy uh, to, pro to put into research improvement activities in a way that sometimes more senior researchers, more senior academics who have a lot more responsibilities and commitments may not have. And importantly, early career researchers are the largest cohort of scientists. So if we are going to see improvements in science, if we are going to see reform efforts actually come to reality, we need early career researchers to be a part of it. So to learn more about the outcome of our result of the event, please see the preprint. We also have another document on osf.io with the specific tips and tricks for early career researchers working to improve science. And we have an article 
um, which explains how we brought together scientists and researchers from around the world um, in an asynchronous virtual unconference. So I encourage you to please check out these resources uh, to see more details. But today we have a wonderful panelist who will each um, speak for about five minutes um, about their initiatives and their experience with early career researchers improving science. So I'd like, um, oh, and just to note, please put your questions in the Q&A and, and not the chat. We'll have Q&A at the end. So um, first up is Dr. Humberto Debat, who is a research scientist with a permanent position at the Institute of Plant Pathology in the Center of Agronomic Research of the National Institute of Agriculture Technology in Argentina. Humberto studies the interface of viruses and crops from a systems biology perspective and for the past year has worked in the Argentine project on SARS-CoV-2 genomics. Humberto is a member of the Advisory Committee in Open Science and Citizen Science of the Ministry of Science of Argentina and has been an ASAP Bio Ambassador, an eLife Community Ambassador, an affiliate of the Bio Archive Preprint Server, and co-developer of Panlingua, a multilingual discovery and reading tool for preprints in the life sciences. So Humberto, did you want to um, show slides to share your screen? Uh, well, I, I don't have slides to share. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Great. Thank, you. Thank you, Dr. Kent. It's a pleasure to be here. So the majority of scholarly work in biology is published in English, a language most of the world does not speak. To help remedy this key issue, hindering inclusive scientific dialogue, we built Panlingua, a multilingual preprint search tool intended to enable search and global access to machine translations of all preprints hosted at bioarchives. At Panlingua, users can enter search terms in their native language and view search results linking to the full text of all available articles translated into more than 100 languages. But language is just one of the barriers affecting global scientific communication, especially among our communities. Latin America represents 8% of the world population, 4% of researchers, and 5% of global academic publications. 30% of our people lack access to internet, 30% is poor, 62 million live in extreme poverty. We are a region of asymmetries and contradictions with tremendous disparities, culturally diverse, with one of the lowest global R&D spending. We are trading societies, we produce awesome publicly funded science, our salaries are ridiculously low, we are resilient, hardworking, creative minds, we are so poor. Doing science in Latin America is about passion, empathy, solidarity, community, and responsibility. As we wave our manuscript around with our humble results, balancing visibility, affordability, and institutional requirements, we fight to disseminate our findings wherever we find them fit, for months, sometimes for years, in disadvantage, against all odds, despite setbacks. In addition, we are seeing a transition in the publishing ecosystem. The ground is moving. The advancements of the open access movement is a flag towards the democratization of knowledge. Nevertheless, we perceive that this flask has been co-opted by some players in the industry, which have accommodated their business model in a way that could perpetuate the asymmetries of the scholar publishing and exclude even more researchers from the scholar communications. We are seeing a shift from paywalls to publish walls. We are observing the preposterous inflation and expansion of the so-called article processing charters, which are not only unaffordable for our region, they are unethical. The discussions about APCs transcends open science. It's a discussion about constructing views of academic communication. It's about privilege and social justice. It's about the inclusion. To encourage APCs is to view scientific knowledge as a commodity rather than a human right, rather than a public good. Brazil spent $36 million between 2012 2016 on APCs, equivalent to the cost of providing sanitized water for a year to more than eight of the 77 million Latin Americans who do not have access to drinking water. I live in a country where 80% of scientific activity is financed with public funds and where 40 of the population is poor. Our graduate students have incomes below the poverty line. This scenario impl implies that it is scandalous to pay exorbitant figures so that five publishing companies that exercise an oligopoly in an imperfect market continue to accumulate wealth. We are, we are expectant of where with our 5% of articles will end up, how this figure may diverge. As CCRs, we need to be a part on a shift on publishing practice, encouraging the non-commercial roots of academic communications, 
and supporting the development and maintenance of communication infrastructure led by and for the academy. It is becoming evident that many journals reflect anachronic 20th century pre-digital platforms, elites reserved for certain affiliations, valuing mostly mainstream science, if any for the few, a chat along, among privileged and highly funded research, many white, many rich, mostly men. I am failing to perceive how the academic publishing ecosystem values diversity, which routes they plan to take to modernize their journals, how are they working to make their venues more inclusive with more gender balance, to be platforms that embrace more voices from the South where science is a global conversation. Beyond publishing, our funders should be redirecting the resource we spend on subscriptions. 11 Latin American countries spend $100 million, mostly uh, uh, public funds, on access to academic journals last year. 80% corresponded to the five largest commercial powders. We're giving millions to reach scientific knowledge that should be free. We should immediately cancel the waste of research in leonine contracts with the commercial publishing industry who has sequestered our scientific legacy. This issue transcends academic publications and involves research assessment practice. We are affected by monopolies of the indexing systems and bibliometric indicators that unfailingly accentuated the dichotomy of mainstream and peripheral science, resulting in, as Cameron Nilo says, excellent in research as a neo-colonial agenda. I think we have an opportunity in this context to break the vicious circle that commercializes evaluative cultures, to bet on circulation indicators over journal metrics and redirect our indicators towards the public impact of our work beyond impact factors. We must remember that our research agendas must be aligned with the prosperity of our region and not with the imposition of a defined recipe for success in another market. We are not in academia to accumulate publications in journals to advance our careers as individuals. Science is a collective enterprise that has to look towards society and understand its demand for knowledge. The way to strengthen our communication system is to align it to our society, to our needs, to our history. The real impact of our research has nothing to do with rankings. Our communication system is a strength if it is faced in society to the extent that it generates inclusion and well-being of our people. And that, I think, is where ECR should lead a wave of change. Science is a shared enterprise, a global endeavor enriched by the multiplicity of visions, realities, and languages. Everybody, everyone benefits from the development of a more inclusive ecosystem and seamless international scholarly discourse is a real possibility. Many barriers are stopping this utopia. As ECRs, we have the opportunity to transform research culture. Let's embrace this responsibility. Thank you. Thank you, Humberto. So our next panelist is Dr. Nafisa Jadavi, who is a neuroscientist and assistant professor at Midwestern University and research professor at Carleton University. Her laboratory investigates how the brain responds to different biological processes throughout the lifespan and specifically how maternal nutrition contributes to offspring neurodevelopment, neurological diseases, and aging. She is the chair of the advisory board for reproducibility for everyone. Thank you for joining, Nafisa. Thanks, uh, Dr. Kent, for that introduction, um, and thanks for including me in this panel. Are you able to see my slides? Yep, yeah. looks good. Okay, perfect, thank you. So, um, I'm going to speak a little bit about the Reproducibility for Everyone initiative that I've been a part of for a few, few years. Um, Dr. Or Tracy has also been part of this um, initiative as well. Um, so the Reproducibility for Everyone initiative is um, a community-led education uh, program where we try to um, increase uh, the discovery and adaptation of reproducibility tools at scale. Um, and so what we do is we run workshops um, at different um, uh, meet scientific meetings um, at um, different institutions to educate individuals about reproducibility tools. Um, and since um, the initiative has started in 2018, we've had about 100 plus volunteers that have run over um, 50 workshops um, across the world. These are international workshops. Um, that have included over 3,000 participants. Um, so we've been really, really active in getting um, this information out in terms of different tools that can be used by researchers, um, early career researchers um, specifically, as well as uh, 
um, mid-career or late-career researchers in terms of implementing tools in their uh, research laboratories. Um, and why we started this initiative was that there was um, a lot of things that were missing um, in terms of uh, reproducibility in that discussion in the biomedical uh, sciences and in other science fields. Um, you know, the majority of researchers being uh, left behind. Um, and in terms of scaling um, these initiatives and different tools that can be used to be reproducible, um, there was that uh, missing link. And in terms of focusing on how um, an individual researcher's um, work can benefit was also missing. And um, what we wanted to do was to include innovative um, ideas that could easily be implemented by researchers that attended our, our educational workshops. And so one thing that we end off our workshops with is, you know, we present a lot of information, but we also ask researchers, you know, I know you're overwhelmed, we've shared a lot of ideas, but, you know, take one thing and try and implement it into your daily um, research program, you know, something like an electronic lab notebook or writing up protocols or things like that. Um, to help move your research um, forward in terms of it being uh, more reproducible. And so these, what our workshops do, which I've hinted at a little bit um, as I've been talking, is that they provide this overview um, of different open projects that um, researchers can get involved in. Um, and what we try and do is we keep our, our workshops to about 30 to 90 minutes and we try and target a really large um, variety of audiences, so in a number of fields, plant sciences to the biomedical sciences. Um, and we try to hit all the different career stages because anyone can really implement the tools that we discuss in our uh, workshops um, if that's something that they want to do into their research program. Um, we recently published our work um, in eLife um, outlining our reproducibility for everyone initiative and you know what we do and how we do it. All of our workshop material is freely available on our website. Um, you can also, individuals can also watch workshops that have been recorded. Um, and we often get um, instructors or facilitators for our workshops that have been prior attendees. Um, and so if you're interested in getting involved um, or learning more, please you know, visit our website, um, don't be shy. And we're always looking for people to get involved and volunteer in different aspects of our initiatives. So um, we're looking to get a lot of people involved. Um, we have um, some funding from the CDI initiative um, as well as other sponsors that I'd like to thank um, for supporting us throughout the years and currently. Um, to let us do our great work and to have a permanent staff member who does a lot of um, the infrastructural work and initiatives. So thank you very much. And I look forward to your questions. Oh, I was muted. Um, just a reminder that <laughs> um, if anyone has any questions, please put them in the Q&A box. Um, and we will get to them at the end. Uh, so next up is Dr. Gary McDowell, who has a background in biomedical research and co-founded the nonprofit Future of Research, which seeks to advocate for and with early career researchers to achieve systemic change in the academy. He ran Future of Research for three years full time and has now continued working to help future generations of researchers to reach their potential in his new role as a consultant providing expertise on the early career researcher population to organizations and providing early career researchers with strategies to affect change. Welcome, Gary. Hey, thanks, uh, Dr. Kent, and thanks to everyone here. Uh, so great to see you. Um, so I have been uh, involved with advocating for and with early career researchers for uh, getting on for eight years now. Um, first, as, as Dr. Kent mentioned, in the nonprofit Future of Research, um, and that organization sought to communicate the issues faced by early career researchers in their academic environments and propose solutions to overcome those problems. And we did this primarily by hosting conferences or workshops 
uh, we would gather lots of people in the room. Um, we would talk through the problems and the issues that people were having, uh, and then try to come up with solutions, um, strategic ways of overcoming those problems. And then we as an organization would take those things forward and communicate those to stakeholders, such as funding organizations and universities. Um, I continue to work in this space as a consultant, um, and as Dr. Kent said, more specifically helping organizations think about how to better serve this population, um, and generally just sort of working as a freelance academic in a space thinking about uh, grad students and postdocs. Um, so on the issue of uh, including early career researchers in science improvement, uh, for me, this is really um, an issue of representation. Uh, most of the organizations and institutions that hold power in science and in the research enterprise, um, their, their most powerful committees and structures are dominated by faculty, um, dominated by senior faculty, and also dominated by faculty from a select group of institutions, uh, and so are not representative globally, um, even within countries, um, uh, even of all faculty. Um, and so in order to have a realistic sense of what research looks like in order to make decisions in those structures, uh, it's really important to have representation and that includes across career stage. Um, and particularly thinking about the people who are um, certainly in biomedicine, which is my background, the people who are at the bench doing the research, what the day to day looks like for them um, and what their uh, environment is like in trying to succeed as scientists, succeed as researchers, and to, to take the science they're working on forward, um, it's really important that they, they be in the room. Uh, and so that was a lot of the work of, uh, of Future of Research included trying to get more representation of people into those uh, powerful places, into those rooms. Uh, and as someone who sat in some of those rooms myself as the, the first young person in, in some committees, uh, it's really kind of scary, some of the, the misconceptions that there are. Uh, when those voices are not there. So representation is, is very, very important. I think one of the, the key lessons that came up for us um, was the need to have a broad ecosystem of people affecting change. And I think one of the things that was really useful in having um, uh, someone in a full-time role like myself who was outside the academy, uh, who had left the traditional structure, uh, and was so no, no longer subject to um, concerns about existing in that structure. Um, I'm able to speak much more freely uh, about uh, what people are experiencing. Um, and I often try to speak from a place of gathering data and communicating that data, um, very data focused. And so that has been really helpful um, in trying to communicate things. Um, uh, and I think it's, it's important to try and consider having people outside the academy and within um, as one vector of, of thinking of, of who in the science ecosystem is involved in these conversations. Um, and that has certainly been really helpful for, for a lot of the things we were working on. I think it's important too to think about a, a broader connection of um, uh, all kinds of people in the system trying to affect change, including early career researchers, because we find that not only is there the problem of general turnover um, of grad students and postdocs in temporary positions, um, sometimes even on faculty. But uh, there's an issue that within advocacy, there can be quite a high rate of burnout. And so um, trying to spread work across numerous people and across numerous organizations and really collaborate and work together uh, and share ideas and share knowledge is really important. Uh, and that's actually why um, the, the unconference um, that, that we all participated in was such a great event. I was able to learn so much and hear about what was going on elsewhere. And really, I think this is sort of the next phase um, in, in the, the landscape of early career researchers affecting change. I think there's a lot of groups now who have gotten to grips with the, the issues of establishing themselves, of setting up and of starting to, to get their, their foot in the door. And now I think it's important for us to try to think about all of us connecting together better. Um, um, and, and certainly thinking about being in the US, uh, researchers are told to be very independent and there's a big drive to be working independently. Um, and so I think it's hard for a lot of academics to try and think about changing um, the system uh, with other people and together. So I think we, we have to, to think about that a lot more. Uh, thanks so much for having me here. Great. Thank you, Gary.
Um, and our, our last panelist is Dr. Kleber Neve. I'm so glad uh, that your internet hasn't <laughs> been affected by the storm. Um, Dr. Neve is part of the coordinating team of the Brazilian Reproducibility Initiative. He has a PhD in neurosciences and a, a bachelor of science in biomedical science from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. His neuroscience research focuses on brain evolution and complex networks. And since 2018, he has worked on the Brazilian Reproducibility Initiative and on the No Budget Science Hack Week, as well as on many meta science research projects on issues relating to reproducibility, preprints, and translational research. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I was lucky. So the lights just went out like five minutes before this started, but it seems to be fine now. Can you all see the screen? Yeah. Okay, so, uh, well, thank you for the, inv the invitation. Uh, Brienne mentioned that I, uh, I'm from Rio de Janeiro. And so I, I've worked in meta science in two main initiatives, which is one is the Brazilian Reproducibility Initiative. I'm part of the coordinating team. team. And well, this is a, a replication effort much in, in the mode of, of the ones that came before, like uh, the replication project psychology or cancer biology, <coughs> where we're, we're gathering uh, multiple labs to, to reproduce experiments that were published pretty much in line with, with the, the previous panel about big team science. It's one of those. And we're, we're, this is, is ongoing. And the other, the other initiative, which has a, a meta scientific band, is no budget science, which started before used uh, meta science as a term, for, as a name for this. But we were discussing what would be meta scientific issues in, in the university back in, in 2016, 15, and this eventually evolved to become a, a more training focused initiative when it became a hack week which is now and well we just had it, the third edition uh last month and well this is people gathering from for for two weeks or one week and trying to develop projects on meta science or tools to to improve science somehow and this has been going on uh, both have have generous funding from the sap leader institute which is a, a, a private funder of science in brazil so uh, regarding early career researchers, so, so no budget science is more focused for training and it's more directly related to the issues we discuss in the, the, the virtual brainstorm paper, the unconference. Uh, but but the, the insight I, I want to bring from the, the lesson learned from, from these two initiatives is that uh, one thing that Brian mentioned in, in the, the introduction that ACRs, are, so postdocs, graduate students or or even in our case, even the, the PIs that are part of, of our collaborating teams actually are skew very young. And these are the ones doing the experiments and, and, and you know discussing with us, the coordinating team, the, the, the nitty gritty of the, the, the protocols. So uh, these are the people who are actually caring about, about and implementing all, all the recommendations we do in terms of, of reproducibility. And uh, no budget science is very focused on, on on training. So, and usually, again, as mentioned in the introduction, uh, the, the people who have time to engage in training in new fields and all, usually uh, are, are ECRs, right? And uh, on the one hand, having ECRs being the ones who are engaged in improving science in meta science uh, is great, right? Because uh, they, they are the future. They, they hopefully will be here for a long time, and and uh, this early exposition to, to the issues in meta science will, will have a, a long lasting impact in their careers and they will uh, hopefully uh, spread that to, to other people. And that's a, a great uh, strong suit for, for ECRs. But on the other hand, uh, these are the people who are collecting the data and the people who are caring about improving data collection and, and how we do science in general. These are the people who are in, uh, lowest on the, 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 the academic hierarchy and they, are, uh, they have unstable jobs and they don't have uh, much certainty about the future. They don't even know uh, if they're going to be able to, to remain in academia. And that is, uh, you know, the, this reality varies from, from place to place. But uh, I, I think that there, there's some universal truth here. Of course, this is all based on, on my impression. I'd love to hear about, about data on, on, on this. 
And and one thing we do see in particular, and, and it's made me think a lot, is that uh, from no budget science, we get the experience that, that people come and from those two weeks where they're there doing the event, the hack week, and it's very collaborative and everybody's on Zoom all the time because we're doing virtual events now. And during those two weeks, it's very great and the projects uh, move very fast. But after those two weeks, it's, it's often the, the people just drop out of the projects, right? Because, you know, they have other priorities. So this has made me think of, of uh, the survival of meta science as a field or the movement for improving science, if you, if you don't want to talk about the discipline itself. But uh, uh, this whole motivation to improve science, if it's really dependent on the motivation and we win free time off ECRs, uh, it's, it's not really sustainable because, uh, uh, you know, it, it, as long as meta science activities are not rewarded, people, when, when, when push comes to shove, they will prioritize the thing that gets them jobs and, and, and papers and publications and the things that actually make you, you advance your career in academia or, or even the things that give you opportunities outside of academia. And I think this, this ties in to, to uh, one of the first panels in, in the morning today, or my morning, that uh, that was talking about uh, how we should go about institutionalizing meta science, and I think the institutionalization of meta science maybe I don't think it's a good idea to create meta science departments, but uh, how meta science will become a, a more mainstream part of, of the academic structure will, in, in large part, be determined by or will determine how ECRs will will uh, come in. To, to more permanent positions and how they will become a part of academia in the long term. So uh, I'll, I'll end up on that note and I, I ask you that you you confirm or disconfirm my impressions that this is the case. Uh, I don't know if there's much data on that. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so now we'll t turn, well, actually first, I do wanna give uh, Tracy an opportunity if you want to say anything um, or have any comments before we turn to the Q&A. Yeah, I think, um, thank you to all our panelists for joining. I think our goal was to give you a sense of some of the various different things that ECRs are working on and the power that ECR initiatives can have in changing so many different aspects of science. But I would also ask you to remember that this is a really small portion of the participants are in you know, our original event. Um, where we had a lot of dynamic discussions about not just what people are doing, but how they are doing it and what we can learn from other ECRs who have been successful in founding initiatives, in leading initiatives, um, in building communities around their initiatives, often in very difficult circumstances. And often these are um, very widespread or global communities, like for example, Nafisa's example of reproducibility for everyone. Um, and so I think I would really encourage you to use the symposium to ask questions about how to do those things and not just to focus on what it is that people are doing. Great. Thank you, Tracy. So we have one question that's come through the chat, but I do encourage um, attendees to put their questions in the Q&A box um, so that everyone can read it. Uh, so this question um, is for Dr. McDowell. Um, Dr. McDowell, you had made a point that we need to get more organized in the way that we advocate for change. For example, across the various ECR or open science initiatives and organizations. In other industries, unions are a powerful mechanism for organizing individuals to take action collectively. Yet we don't have a union for the global research community. Is it time we create an open science union to advocate for progress and researchers' interests? It's a great question. Um, I'm very pro union generally. So um, I, you know, unions have great power in affecting this kind of change. Um, I think this gets to the, the point of we don't need to necessarily reinvent the wheel. There are people in this world who are very effective at. Um, at pushing for change and advocating for change and it'd be great to like use those structures and lessons in in our own context uh, i mean one thing that this made me think of is i'm really disappointed with a lot of scientific societies right now in this space because um i am a member of some societies that have been advocating to block my access to papers 
because I don't work at university, I don't have institutional access to publications. Um, and so, um, you know, I have to get them through Sci-Hub essentially. And um, yeah, I, I find myself in the weird position um, in the States uh, in the last couple of years advocating to the Trump administration, which was one of the greatest champions for um, open publications in the States uh, because of the pushback against, uh, against it from scientific societies and, and publishing organizations. And so I think there is more, it'd be interesting to, to, to think about, is there a need to think about a society that is focused on science rather than um, academics and the, the way academia, uh, protecting academic interests. I, I was really struck by something Humberto said of, you know, that, that the point of science is to solve problems and to, to, to do this research. It's not to publish papers and it's not careerism. And that frankly is a major reason that I left because it's, um, that is the direction that I, I sadly see things are in. And so I, I think that th this is a, a super important point of like the, what organization should there be broadly? It, it could be a union, but is it that there's a problem also with the structures that we have? Scary. Um, so another question now is for Humberto, Humberto sorry. Um, which obstacles do you think affect ECRs um, specifically in Latin America? Like what are the obstacles that are more prevalent for ECRs in, in Latin America? Well, uh, during my short talk, I mentioned poverty, which is a very important issue in the region that all, which uh, affects uh, broadly all our lives activities in, and puts uh, in a different perspective, our role as scientists, what uh, Gary mentioned uh, just uh, before is that uh, we have a, a very important responsibility because we are financed by taxpayer money in, in countries where there is a lot of lack of funding and, uh, and, and budgets for social and health, etc. So uh, every time that there is some um, funding to do research you really have to think what what you should be doing with that money uh, what uh, what is that research going to help your society the people where you live and, uh, and of course during the pandemic that that, that has raised it a lot it's like we have joined forces with many ECRs uh, uh, in our countries in, in in different regions to try to 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 prevent the loss of of, of life so that it's 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 a it's like a different issue. Before the pandemic, we were like thinking in very uh, separated, uh, without a, a real community, without in integrating our capacities. And I think that the pandemic has helped us uh, try to understand that we are towards the same path, that, that we all together want the same thing, which is to try to, to, to generate knowledge that, that is useful for our societies. So in that sense, uh, I think that, the, that one of the main issues that we have now is try to convince our leaders that investing in science is, uh, is the best way to try to solve the problems of this society. So a lot of effort that we have to do is try to push into the authorities to try to provide more, more, more funding for our activities. And, and being ECRs, the, the, the most prevalent research, researchers all over the world, as you have mentioned before, we are like uh, most of the people doing science. So we should join forces to try to push uh, to, to, uh, to uh, an agenda where, where funded is a reality and we can solve problems in our societies with a specific budget in the long term is more specifically. Thank you. Our next May question. On, sure, of I course. add on what Umberto just said? That, mm -hmm. uh, I think this is something that I think about a lot that meta science is very focused at least so far on on how we do science right that uh, how we get the answers and how we get answers that we can trust and I think the whole point about useful knowledge and, and knowledge that is relevant to society and to local concerns is, is really about the watch like what questions do we want to answer and and well of course we need good answers but there's a reflection that comes before that it's about the contents not not the, the, the method yeah, that's such a good point. So our next question uh, is for Tracy. 
I was watching your presentation on metrics today, and it seems that follow-up of students is good in your initiative and they finish the project. I think that has a huge overlap with the questions raised by Kleber. How you and Kleber think that ECRs could be more consistent with these initiatives, no budget science and your initiative with Quest. So how could ECRs be more consistent with these and follow through? Okay, um, I'll briefly provide some context for those who were not in the in the metrics webinar earlier today. Um, essentially, so I started an initiative through the eLife Ambassadors program called the eLife Ambassadors Meta Research Team, where participants learn about meta research by working together to design, conduct, and publish a meta research study. Um, and I've since translated that into a six month course that I run in Berlin with students from four different Berlin universities. Um, and I think one of the thing that's one of the things that's really important in the success of our projects and the reason students are able to finish is that they're all working together on the same project. And so if students are sort of individually working on an idea, um, they get to a point where they realize they don't have the resources. It's going to take a larger team than they have. And at that point, it becomes difficult to proceed with the project, especially if they don't have outside support from their supervisor or others in their lab group or community. And so part of how initiative our initiative works is the fact that everyone agrees that, you know, we have this goal coming in to design, conduct and publish a meta research study. Um, and then it's also that because participants are often working in small groups, no one wants to be holding the group back. And so everyone is motivated to you know, keep working and keep moving their part of the project forward. And they see other groups doing the same thing in our meeting every week. Um, and we also use other ways of motivating. So we encourage, like we've done blog posts or other things so that students have an early output to share the work that they're doing or the things that they're learning. Um, the students have in the past found conferences where they can share abstracts and start to talk to their about, to other scientists about their meta research. And so those are some of the strategies that we use to keep people motivated and moving forward in our initiative. Um, and I think Kleber can perhaps address the question more related to the No Budget Science Week. Yeah. I actually heard about your, your talk and metrics earlier because other people from the group were there and, and sadly was very relevant and I should have been there. But uh, uh, yeah, no, I, I was actually trying to, to, to learn from you because uh, we, we actually have very, very you know, bad follow up and we are now experimenting. This is the third edition. We always change the format a bit and we're experimenting now with, with regular meetings. So one month after, two months after, we would we'll try to, to follow up closely to the project to see if, if something comes up, if people have a, a longer term commitment. But I'll know if this works in, in six months, maybe. Yeah, I think the group mentoring approach can be a very powerful one, um, as well as emphasizing to people from the beginning that they will need a team and to think about who they might be able to get and encourage to join their team. Um, so I'll, I'll share a link in a chat for a couple minutes for a paper that talks about our initiative for um, running a participant guided learn by doing meta research course, which has more details for those who are interested. Thank you. So the next question I think is um, directed at Nafisa. Um, I am a young neuroscientist and I have the impression that the scientific endeavor has become about selecting convenient data to publish convenient stories. I think venues like this conference are very useful, but I have the impression that tomorrow I will go to work and life will continue to be about finding significant differences and putting aside what does not go in that direction. How to involve academic directives in the direction of open and reproducible science? Okay, that's a great question. Thank you, Danielle. Um, so yes, I mean, the academic currency is publications, right? And there are journals that are very um, pro-significant differences in telling the story. Um, but I think that there is a movement um, about publishing negative data and data that is not, you know, significant. Um, unfortunately, um, this movement is really slow. Um, and there's a lot of resistance to it because we want to, you know, cure 
X disease or X or, you know, whatever, insert your field of study here. Um, so I think, you know, um, it's definitely hard, a hard place to be as a trainee um, when you're in a lab that maybe is pushing for um, publications and positive data and significant differences. Um, but I think um, what I would recommend or, or trying to, to, to do is to build a network of people that are more, you know, that might be open-minded towards not that viewpoint and to get them involved potentially with your work um, and to get feedback. Um, I always advocate to my trainees and other trainees and students is to, to build a community or a network of people um, and to get feedback on how you can, um, you know, uh, um, sort of start this change within your area or within your um, school or program or, or whatever, wherever you may be. Um, I mean, it can seem very daunting because the scientific world is, you know, um, very old, and some people are very set in certain ways. Um, but I think that if you're able to make some change where you are, then that's um, that's great. That's some people that were affected by your way of thinking about data, and that you know it's not always has there doesn't always have to be a significant difference. Um, you know, this is something that I've tried to do when I've started my own group is to to foster this way of thinking and that, you know, I am, yeah, the PI and my name goes on the paper and the grants and stuff, but we have a discussion about the data and what it means. And, and you know, people, we all work together. I'm at the bench, students are at the bench, staff are at the bench. And so, um, uh, and it's my little lab, but I think that, you know, I'm training students that are going off and doing their, you know, their future training in other places. So hopefully I'm trying to sort of plant these little seeds of, of change, even, you know, um, in, in an area or in a field that is very um, dominated by finding significant differences, because I too myself am also a neuroscientist too. So hopefully that answers your question or gives you some uh, uh, feedback <laughs> on this very um, touchy subject. <laughs> um, speaking of touchy subjects, the next question <laughs> is, um, and it's not directed at any one individual, but I can, um, I'm sure several of you may have um, thoughts. Do you think there is a selection effect where early career researchers who stay in academia and become senior researchers are the ones who are least bothered by the system? as people like yourselves either leave or pivot into meta-research. How can we strategically get reformers into positions of power? Would any of the panelists like to tackle that? I, I will give it a go because I have given this a lot of thought. Yeah. Um, I think there's a broad distribution effect where the simple answer could be yes, but I think there's a lot of caveats here. And the first is, uh, there's a phenomenon in, in business research, actually, that people who resign from organizations generally, um, there can often be a common factor that they are the people who care the most about it and just cannot persist in that space any longer. They care so much. And I think that there, there's certainly that element that played in for me. But I think there are people who try to find a way of um, uh, what it is that their values align with um, and whether they can affect change based on what it is that they can see being able to do. Uh, Nafisa just said change is very slow in the academy, which is true. And I think this is a big part of why I just didn't have the patience for that. And so that I think, I think all of these factors come in for, for what determines, but I think it, it's, it raises an important point that some of the things I have heard uh, that are the most awful uh, about like how the academy shouldn't change have come from very junior people. Um, junior faculty and because there are a subset who are super bought into the system because they have succeeded in it 
And there's a lot of this, it is important not to try and like have a broad brush of, oh, all junior faculty do this and all postdocs do that and all these people do this because there is, there is a great spectrum of people bought into it um, and people not bought into it. And I think you will have some stay and some go. Um, I, I think it takes, it just takes a lot of persistence to stay in um, if you also see the system is broken. And so I have, my favorite faculty to work with are the ones who are, who are like really see the problems and then are also trying to figure out how, how to deal with that. But there are some who it's, I, I, think, I think it helps a lot of people not to be bothered by it or you know that they just are bought into the system and that's their way of dealing. And so I think that that issue can certainly arise. Um, and I had, when I was leaving, I had people say to me, oh, it's such a shame that you're leaving um and you know you should stay or whatever and I was like well I don't really want to but also I think there I, I think there is a again this speaks to the, the earlier point of I feel I'm more helpful outside than I would be inside I feel I would have been a terrible PI trying to have like mentor people and do work and also try to do this I don't think I'd have been very good at, at, at any of it and so I think better distribution of labor and supporting each other is is key there and so um, yeah, but, but again, getting, and then we need to help the people who are still in the academy, who are good people to get into those positions of power. I think this is all, again, the reinforcement and the, the, the network, uh, needing to be, to be strong. Yeah. And, and like Gary said, there are people at every career stage who are, are fighting the good fight. You know, there are, there, it's not, we're here talking about the role of early career researchers, but so much of what early career researchers can do is really working with some people who are in these positions of power. So certainly you have people bought into the system at every stage and you also have people actively using their positions of power to also promote change. So um, I think that was a good point. Would anyone else like to speak to that or should we go to the next question? Um, I can briefly add a point, Humberto, very cute dog. That was not my point. Um, my, my point was that the, the key thing that we kept hearing over and over in the young conference, and you'll see it prominently placed in the preprint was people were saying over and over this work that I do to improve science is not rewarded. It's not incentivized. Um, and it can actually, it's actually in some cases perceived as a distraction that takes away from my ability to get grants and publish papers. And until that changes, it's going to be very hard to keep people in the system. Um, outside of psychology, it can be very difficult to find journals that publish meta research. It's hard to find funders that will fund it. There are lots of people who don't think it's research and there are very few um, places where meta researchers can get jobs within the scientific system. And so I think solving that for not just meta researchers, but people doing all aspects of science improvement is really critical to change. I also think that just finding um, if you can a space in the system where you can make change is really important. For me, I started doing meta science because I was frustrated by people using bar graphs of continuous data just constantly. And so we published a meta research paper on it in 2015, which went viral very, very quickly and contributed to policy changes in a lot of journals. And for me, that really just shifted my horizon of what was possible. Um, and over time, I became less and less interested in the more physiological research that I was doing and more and more interested in, you know, not just how do I publish this paper, but how do I do more meta science in a way that I can see it having an impact, that I can see it changing journal policies, changing laboratory behavior, changing the way that authors think about and engage with their data. And so I think if you can find a place within the system, you can that will help um, some of these feelings of discord. And if you don't find that place within the system or it's just not something you wanna look for and you would rather be Gary and help to work to improve things from outside, I think that is also amazing. Um, Gary needs friends and we need more people like Gary. So I don't think there's any shame in saying, you know, I need to leave the system in order to be able to do what I wanna do. I think if you need to leave the system, do what you wanna do, just do that. Well said, we need more Gary's. <laughs> um, so I think this will probably be our last question. And I think it's a good one to end on is can participants talk about how getting involved in reform and or meta research has benefited their careers? We talk a lot about how advocacy work, 
pushing for reform is seen as a distraction. It's not incentivized. But does anybody have an example of how actually participating in this work has helped their career? I, I can say, if no, but go, no, if you said, please go. Yeah, no, 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 no please. It's, it's I want to hear from the panelists. <laughs> Um, I think my work with reproducibility um, for everyone has really, when I started my independent research group, has really helped me um, set up an infrastructure where we can do reproducible science. I hope, that's my hope, but it's been only a few years. And so I think that's been really great. The friendships that I have made um, being involved in these different initiatives have been amazing. Um, and the support and the different opportunities that have presented themselves have, I think, been really, have enriched my um, uh, scientific career. And I'm grateful uh, for what I've, um, you know, what I've contributed and what I've also, you know, uh, received, I guess, as being a part of these initiatives. Um, so yeah, thanks. Thank you, absolutely. I think it, for me, it's like growing the network. Um, which has led to new collaborations scientifically, new grant applications, invitations to things um, that even though often, it, but by some people it is seen as a distraction from science, um, I certainly have had the same experience of uh, Nafisa and there are new opportunities that actually do help uh, my science by just building my network. Any other examples? Um, I mean, I was I was just kind of through it. I mean, the most obvious tangible example was the work I did as a postdoc ended up in me getting a three year grant to set up and run future of research. Um, and, you know, I've continued to work in this space. Um, and I, it's funny, all the things I enjoyed about being an academic, um, publishing papers, applying for grants, getting rejected from grants, which happened recently, you know, I can, you can still do that outside, outside of a university, you can still get rejected from a grant. <laughs> and um, uh, but you, you know, you can still do, I, I think this is part of the, the interesting thing is that people think the academy is the only place to do things, whereas the academy is a structure, you know, I've worked in the academy in a nonprofit and in, in a for-profit, but essentially an LLC, um, a, a business setup. And, you know, all of these are just ways of, of having a structure in which to do this kind of work. And you can still participate in doing all of these kinds of things. And I collaborate and I'm still part of all kinds of networks because of this kind of work. So my career, you know, I used to work on frogs and I, you know, nobody knows about my frog work now. And like, I have this completely different academic career um, that's based in, in all of this great stuff. So, um, yeah, it can it can take you in a new and more interesting direction is, is my perspective, yeah. Great, well, thank you. This was a, a nice note to end on, I think something positive. Um, so thank you to our panelists. Uh, thank you, Tracy, for joining. Uh, this was really a wonderful discussion uh, and it was great to see everybody. So thank you and thank you to all the attendees um, who asked really great questions and took the time uh, to join us today. Thank you. <laughs>